again, everybody. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Hope you're well. Hope you're enjoying it. Let me know if you are or you're not. Um, chapter 32. Quite a long chapter, this one. It's called Cetology. Cetology, the study of whales. Already we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unsured, harbourless immensities. Ere that comes to pass, ere the Peacod's weedy hull rolls side by side with the barnacled hulls of the Leviathan, at the outset it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough appreciative understanding of the more special Leviathanic revelations and allusions of the sorts which are to follow. I like Leviathanic, that's a good word. It is some systemized exhibition of the whale in his broad genera that I would now fain put upon you. Yet it is no easy task. The classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less, is here essayed. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. No branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cetology, said Captain Scoresby, A.D. 1820. It is not my intention, were it in my power, to enter into, the, enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetitia, cetitia into groups and families. Utter confusion exists among the historians of this animal, a sperm whale, said Sergeant Beale, A.D. 1839. Unfit to pursue our, our research in the unfathomable waters, impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the Cetitia, a field strewn with thorns, all these incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists. Thus speak of the whale, the great Cuvier and John Hunter and Lesson, those lights of zoology and anatomy. Nevertheless, though of real knowledge there, be, there may be little, yet of books there are plenty. And so in some small degree with cytology or the science of whales, many are the men, small and great, old and new, landsmen and seamen, who have at large or in little written of the whale. Run over a few. The authors of the Bible, Aristotle, Pliny, Aldrovandi, Sir Thomas Brown, Gesner, Ray, Linnaeus, Rondeletius, Willoughby, Green, Art, Petty, Sibold, Brisson, Martin, Lacepede, Bonterre, Desmarest, Baron Cuvier, Frederick Cuvier, John Hunter, Owen, Scoresby, Beale, Bennett, J. Ross Brown, the author of Miriam Coffin, Olmsted and the Reverend T. Cheever. But to what ultimate generalising purpose of these have written, the above cited extracts will show. Of the names in this list of whale authors, only those following Owen ever saw living whales, but one of them was a real professional harpooner and whaleman, I mean Captain Scoresby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority, but Scoresby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale, compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. And here it be, be it said that the Greenland whale is an usurper upon the throne of the seas. He is not even by any means the largest of the whales, yet owing to the long priority of his claims and the profound ignorance which, till some seventy years back, invested the then fabulous or utterly unknown sperm whale, and which ignorance to this present day still reigns in all but a few scientific retreats and whale ports, the usurpation has been every way complete. Reference to nearly all the Leviathanic, Le Le Leviathanic uh, allusions in the great poets of past days will satisfy you that the Greenland whale, without one rival, was to them the monarch of the seas. But the time has come for a new proclamation. This is Charing Cross, hear ye. Good people, all the Greenland whale is deposed. The great sperm whale now reigneth. There are only two books in being which at all pretend to put the living sperm whale before you, and at the same time in the remotest degree succeed in the attempt. The books are Beale's and Bennett's, both in their time surgeons to the English South Sea whale ships, and both exact and reliable men. 
The original matter touching the sperm whale to be found in their volumes is necessarily small, but so far as it goes, it is of excellent quality, though mostly confined to scientific description. And yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. Now, the various species of whales need some sort of popular comprehensive classification, if only an easy outline, one, of the, one for the present, hereafter be, to be filled with all it, in all its departments by subsequent labourers. And no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my poor endeavours, I, pro I offer my own poor endeavours. I promise nothing complete, because any human thing supposed to be complete must, for that very reason, infallibility be faulty. I shall not pretend to a minute anatomical description of the various species, or in this place at least, so too much of any description. My object here is simply to project the draft of a systemization of cetology. I am the architect, not the builder. But it is a ponderous task. No ordinary letter sorter in the post office to equal the, is equal to it. To grope down into the bottom of the sea after them, to have one's hand among the unspeakable foundations, ribs and very pelvis of the world, this is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this leviathan? The awful tauntings in Job might well appall me. Will he, the leviathan, make a covenant with thee? Behold, the hope of him is in vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans. I have had to do with whales with these visible hands. I am in earnest, and I will try. There are some preliminaries to settle. First, the uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cetology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a whale be a fish. In his system of nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, I hereby separate the whales from the fish. But to my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, alewives and herring, against Linnaeus's expressed edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The, crown, the grounds upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows. On account of their warm, biocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, penem intrantum finam mammis lactatum, and finally, ex lege nature jura merotique. I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin of Nantucket, both messmates of mine on a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. Be it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground <clears throat> that the whale is a fish, and call upon holy Jonah to back me. This fundamental thing settled, the next point is, in what internal respect does the whale differ from other fish? Above, Linnaeus has given you these items, but in brief, they are these, lungs and warm blood, whereas all other fish are lungless and cold-blooded. Next, how shall we define the whale by his obvious externals so as to conspicuously to label him for all time to come? To be short, then, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have him. However, contracted that definition is a result of expanded med uh, meditation. A walrus spouts much like a whale, but the walrus is not a fish, because he is amphibious. But the last term of that definition is still more cogent, as coupled with the first. Almost any one must have noticed that all the fish similar to landsmen have not a flat, but a vertical or up and down tail, whereas among spouting fish, the tail, though it may be primarily shaped, invariably assumes a horizontal position. By the above definition of what a whale is, I do by no means exclude from the Leviathanic Brotherhood any sea creature hitherto identified with the whale by the best informed Nantucketers, nor, on the other hand, link with it any fish hitherto authoritatively regarded as alien. Hence, all the smaller, spouting and horizontal-tailed fish must be included in this ground plan of cetology. Now then, come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. First, according to magnitude, I shall divide the whales into three primary books, 
subdivisible into chapters, and these shall comprehend them all, both small and large. 1. The folio of whale. 2. The octavo whale. 3. The duodecimal whale. As the type of the folio, I present the sperm whale of the octavo, the grampus, and the duodecimal, the porpoise. Folios. Among these, I here include the following chapters. 1. The sperm whale. 2. The right whale. 3. The fin whale. Sorry, the fin back whale. 4. The humpbacked whale. 5. The razorback whale. 6. The sulphur bottom whale. Book 1. Folio. Chapter 1. Sperm whale. This whale, among the English of old vaguely known as the trumper whale, and the physeter whale, and the anvil-headed whale, is the present cachalot of the French, cachalot, and the potsfish of the German, and the macrocephalus of the long words. He is, without doubt, the largest inhabitant of the globe, the most formidable of all whales to encounter, the most majestic in aspect, and lastly, by far the most valuable in commerce as he being the only creature from which that valuable substance, spermaceti, is obtained. All his peculiarities will, in many other places, be enlarged upon. It is chiefly with this name that I now have to do. Of course, we now know that the sperm whale is not the largest of all whales, it's the blue whale, but um, as far as Melville's concerned, it's the largest. Philologically concerned, it is absurd, considered, it is absurd. Some centuries ago, when the sperm whale was almost wholly unknown in his proper individuality, and when his oil was only accidentally obtained from the stranded fish, in those days spermaceti, it would seem, was popularly supposed to be derived from a creature identical with the one then known in England as the Greenland or right whale. It was the idea that this same spermaceti was the quickening humour of the Greenland whale, which the first syllable of the word quickly expresses. In those times also, spermaceti was exceedingly scarce, not being used for light but only as an ointment and medicament. It was only to be had from the druggists, as you nowadays buy an ounce of rhubarb. But then, as I opine, in the course of time the true nature of spermaceti became known, its, individual na- uh, sorry, its original name was still retained by the dealers, no doubt to enhance its value by a notion of so strangely significant of its scarcity. And so the appellation must at last have come to be bestowed upon the whale from which this spermaceti was really devised. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 2, Right Whale. In one respect, this is the most venerable of the Leviathans, being the one first regularly hunted by man. It yields the article uh, commonly known as whalebone or baleen, and the oil, specifically known as whale oil, an inferior article in commerce. Among the fishermen, he is indiscriminately designated by all the following titles. The Whale, the Greenland Whale, the Black Whale, the Great Whale, the True Whale, the Greenland Whale, the Black Whale, the Great Whale, the True Whale, and the Right Whale. There is a deal of obscurity concerning the identity of the species, thus multitudinously baptised. What then is the whale which I include in the second series of my folios? It is the great mysticius of the English naturalists, the Greenland whale of the English, English whalemen, the Balian ordinaire of the French whalemen, the Grolman's wallfish of the Swedes. It is the whale which for more than two centuries past has been hunted by the Dutch and English in the Arctic seas. It is the whale which the American fishermen have long pursued in the Indian Ocean, or the Brazil banks, or the Norwest coast, and various other parts of the world designated by them right whale cruising grounds. Some pretend to see a difference between the Greenland whale of the English and the right whale of the Americans, but they precisely agree in all their grand features, nor has there yet been presented a single determinate fact upon which to ground a radical distinction. It is by endless subdivisions based upon the most inconclusive differences that some departments of natural history become so repellingly intricate. The right whale will be elsewhere treated of at some length with reference to elucidating the sperm whale. Book 1, Chapter 3, Finback. Under this head, I reckon a manner which, by the various names of Finback, Tall Spout, and Long John, has been seen almost in every sea and is commonly the whale whose distant jet is so often described by passengers across, crossing the Atlantic and the New York packet tracks. 
In the length he attains, in his baleen, the fin back resembles the right, right whale, but is of a less portly girth. And lighter colour, approaching to olive. His great lips present a cable-like aspect, formed by the intertwisting slanting folds of large wrinkles. His great distinguishing feature, the fin, which some he, which, from which he derives his name, is often a conspicuous object. This fin is some three or four feet long, growing vertically from the hinder part of the back, of an angular shape, or with a very large pointed end. Even if not the slightest other part of the creature be visible, this isolated fin will, at times, be seen plainly projecting from the surface. When the sea is moderately calm and slightly marked with spherical ripples, and this gnomon-like fin stands up and casts shadows upon the wrinkled surface, it may well be supposed that the watery circle surrounding it somewhat resembles a dial with its style and wavy hour lines graved on it. On that Ahaz dial, the shadow often goes back. The fin back is not gregarious. He seems a whale hater, as some men are man haters. Very shy, almost uh, always going solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters, his straight and single lofty jet rising like a tall misanthropic spear upon the barren plain, gifted with such wondrous power and velocity in swimming as to defy all present pursuit from man, this leviathan seems the banished and unconquerable cane of his race. Uh, bearing for his mark that style upon his back, from having the baleen in his mouth, the finback is sometimes included with the right whale, among a theoretic species denominated whalebone whales. That is, whales with baleen. But these so-called whalebone whales, there would seem to be several varieties, most of which, however, are little known. Broad-nosed whales and beaked whales, pike-headed whales, bunched whales, under-jawed whales, and rostrated whales, which are the fishermen's names for a few sort. In connection with this appellation of whalebone whales, it is of great importance to mention that, however, such a nomenclature may be convenient in facilitating allusions to some kind of whales, yet it is in vain to attempt a clear classification of the leviathan, founded upon either as baleen or hump or fin or teeth, notwithstanding that those marked parts or features very obviously seem better adapted to afford the basis of a regular system of cytology than any other detached broadly d bodily distinctions which the whale, in his kind presents. How then? The baleen, hump, finback, and teeth? These are things which peculiarities are indiscriminately dispersed among all sorts of whale, without any regard to what may be the nature of their structure and other and more essential particulars. Thus, the sperm whale and the humpback whale each has a hump, but there the similarities cease. Then this same hump-backed whale and the Greenland whale, each of these has baleen, but there again the similarity ceases. It is just the same with other parts above mentioned. In various sorts of whales they form such irregular combinations, or, in the case of any one of them, detached such an irregular isolation, as utterly to defy all general methodization formed upon such a basis. On this rock every one of whale naturalists has split. But it may be possibly be conceived that in the internal parts of the whale, in his anatomy there at least, we shall be able to hit the right classification. Nay, what thing, for example, is there in the Greenland whale's anatomy more striking than his baleen? Yet we have seen that by his baleen it is impossible to correctly to classify the Greenland whale. And if you descend into the bowels of the various leviathans, why there you will not find such distinctions a fiftieth part as available to the systemizer as those external ones enumerated. But what then remains? Nothing but to take hold of the whales bodily in their entire liberal volume and bodily sort them that way. And this is the bibliographical system here adopted. And it is the only one that can possibly succeed, for it alone practical, to proceed. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 4, Humpback This whale is often seen on the northern American coast. He has been frequent, frequently captured there and towed into harbour. He has a great pack on him like a peddler, or you might call him the elephant and castle whale. At any rate, the popular name for him does not sufficiently distinguish him, since the sperm whale has, ha, has also a hump, though a smaller one. His oil is not very valuable. He has baleen. 
he has the most gamesome and light-hearted of all the whales, making more gay foam and white water generally than any other of them. Book 1, Folio, Chapter 5, Razorback. Of this whale little is known but his name. I have seen him at a distance off Cape Horn, of a retiring nature. He eludes both hunters and philosophers. Though no coward, he has never yet shown any part of him but his back, which rises in a long, sharp ridge. Let him go. I know little of him, nor does anyone else. Chapter 1, uh, Book 1, Chapter 4, Sulphur Bottom. Another retiring gentleman, with their brimstone belly, doubtless got by scraping along the Tartarian tiles in some of his profounder divings. He is seldom seen, at least I have never seen him except in the remoter southern seas, and then always at too great a distance to study his countenance. He has never chased. He would run away with a rope box of line. Prodig prodigies are told from Adieu, Sulphur Bottom, I can say nothing more than, the, than that is true of ye, nor can the oldest Nantucketer. Thus ends Book 1, Folio, and now begins Book 2, Octavio. Octavios, these embrace the whales of middling magnitude, among which at present may be numbered 1, the Grampus, 2, the Blackfish, 3, the Narwhal, 4, the Thrasher, 5, the Killer. Book 2, Octavio, Chapter 1, Grampus. Though this fish, whose loud sonorous breathing, or rather blowing, has furnished a proverb to landsmen, he is so well known a denizen of the deep, he is not yet popularly classed among whales, but possessing all the grand distinctive features of the leviathan, more naturalists have recognised him for one. He is of moderate octavo size, varying from 15 to 25 feet in length and corresponding dimensions around the waist. He swims in herds, he is never regularly hunted, though his oil is considerable in quantity, and pretty good for light. But some fishermen have pr uh, his approach is regarded as promontory of the advance of the great sperm whale. Book 2, Octavo, Chapter 2, Blackfish. I give the popular fishman's name for all these fish, for generally they are the best. Where any name happens to be vague or inexpressive, I shall say so, and suggest another. I do so now, touching the blackfish, so-called, because blackness is the rule among all, almost all whales. So call him the hyena whale, if you please. His veracity is well known. And from the uh, circumstance that the inner angles of his lips are curved upwards, he carries an everlasting Mephistophelian grin on his face. This whale averages some 16 or 18 feet in length. He is found in almost all latitudes. He has a peculiar way of showing his dorsal fin hooked in swimming, which looks something like a Roman nose. When not more profitably employed, the sperm whale hunters sometimes capture the hyena whale to keep up the supply of cheap oil for domestic employment, as some frugal housekeepers, in the absence of company and quite alone by themselves, burn unsavoury tallow instead of odorous wax. Though the blubber is very thin, some of these whales will yield you upwards of 30 gallons of oil. Book 2, Octavo, Chapter 3, Narwhal. That is the nostril whale, another instance of a curiously named whale, so named, I suppose, from its peculiar horn being originally mistaken for a peaked nose. The creature is some 16 feet in length, while its horn averages 5 feet, though some exceed 10 and even attain to 15 feet. Strictly speaking, this horn is but a lengthened tusk, growing out from the jaw in a line little depressed from the horizontal, but it is only found on the sinister side, which has an ill effect, giving its owner something analogous to the aspect of a clumsy left-handed man. What precise purpose this ivory horn or lance answers, it would be hard to say. It does not seem to be used like the blade of a swordfish and a billfish, though some sailors tell me that the narwhal employs it for a rake in turning over the bottom of the sea for food. Charlie Coffin said it was used for an ice piercer, for the narwhal rising to the surface of the polar sea and finding it sheeted with ice thrusts his horn up and so breaks through. But you cannot prove either of these surmises to be correct. My own opinion that, however, is one, this one-sided whale may really be used by the sorry this one-sided horn may be real, really used by the narwhal. However, that may be, it would certainly be very convenient for him to for to him for a folder in reading pamphlets. The narwhal I have heard called the tusked whale, the horned whale, and the unicorn whale. He is certainly a very curious example of the unicornism to be found in almost every creature, every kingdom of animated nature. 
From certain cloistered old authors, I have gathered that this same sea unicorn's horn was in ancient days regarded as the great antidote against poison, and as such, preparations of it brought immense prices. It was also distilled to a volatile salts for fainting ladies, the same way that the horns of the male deer are manufactured into heart's horn. Originally, it was in itself accounted an object of great curiosity. Black Letter tells me that Sir Martin Frobisher, on his return from that voyage, when Queen Bess did gallantly wave her jewelled hand to him from the window of Greenwich Palace, as his bold ship sailed down the Thames, when Sir Martin returned from that voyage, saith Black Letter, on bended knees he presented to Her Highness a prodigious longhorn of the narwhal, which for a long period after hung in the castle at Windsor. An Irish author avers that the Earl of Leicester, on bended knees, did likewise uh, present to Her Highness another horn pertaining to a land beast of the unicorn nature. The narwhal has a very picturesque, leopard-like long being of a milk-white ground colour dotted with round and oblong spots of black. His oil is very superior, clear and fine, but there is little of it, and he is seldom hunted. He is mostly found in the circumpolar seas. Book 2, Octavio, Chapter 4, Killer. Of this whale, little is precisely known to the Nantucketer, and nothing at all to the professed naturalists. From what I have seen of him at a distance, I would say that he was about the bigness of the Grampus. He is very savage, a sort of Fiji fish. He sometimes takes the great folio whales by the lip and hangs there like a leech till the mighty brute is worried to death. The killer is never hunted. I have never heard what sort of all he has. Exception might be taken to the name bestowed upon this whale on the ground of its indistinctiveness, for we are all killers on land and on sea, Bonaparte and sharks included. Book 2, Octavio, Octavio Chapter 4, Thrasher. This gentleman is famous for his tail, which he uses for a ferule in thrashing his foes. He mounts the folio whale's back, and as he swims, he works his passage by flogging him, as some schoolmasters get along in the world by a similar process. Still less is known of the thrasher than of the killer. Both are outlaws, even in the lawless seas. Thus ends Book 2, Octavio, and begins Book 3, Duodecimal. Duodecimals. This, par this includes the smaller whales 1, the Huzza, Por the Huzza porpoise, two, the Algerine porpoise, three, the Mealy-mouthed porpoise. To those who have not chanced specially to study the subject, it may possibly seem strange that fishes not commonly exceeding four or five feet should be marshalled among whales, a word which in the popular sense also conveys the idea of hugeness. But the creatures set down above as duodecimos are infallibly whales, by the term of my definition of what a whale is, i.e. a spouting fish with a uh, horizontal tail. Book 3, Duodecimal, Chapter 1, Huzza Porp Porpoise. This is the common porpoise found among all the globes. The name is of my own bestowal, for there are more than one sort of porpoises, and something must be done to distinguish them. I call him thus because he always swims in hilarious shoals, upon which the broad sea keep tossing themselves to heaven like caps in a 4th of July crowd. Their appearance is generally hailed with delight by the mariner. Full of fine spirits, they invariably come from the breezy billows to windward. They are the lads that always live before the wind. They are accounted a lucky omen. If you yourself can withstand three cheers at beholding these vivacious fish, then heaven help you. The spirit of godly gamesomeness is not in you. A well-fed, plump hazar porpoise will yield you one good gallon of good oil. But the fine and delicate fluid extracted from his jaws is exceedingly valuable. It is in request among jewellers and watchmakers. Sailors put it on their hones. Porpoise meat is good eating, you know. It may never have occurred to you that a porpoise spouts. Indeed, his spout is so small that it is not very readily discernible. But the next time you have a chance, watch him, and you will see the great sperm whale himself in miniature. Book 3, Duodecimo, Chapter 2, Algerine Porpoise, a pirate. Very savage. He is only found, I think, in the Pacific. He is somewhat larger than the Hazar Porpoise, but much of the same general make. Provoke him, and he will buckle to a shark. 
I have lowered for him many times, but never yet seen him, saw him captured. Book 3, Geodesimo, Chapter 3, Mealy-Mouthed Porpoise. The largest kind of porpoise, and only found in the Pacific, so far as it is known. The only English name by which he has hitherto been designated is that of the fishers, right whale porpoise, from the circumstance that he is chiefly found in the vicinity of that folio. In shape, he differs from some, in some degree from the Hazar porpoise, being of a less rotund and jolly girth. Indeed, he is of quite a neat and gentlemanlike figure. He has no fins on his back, most other porpoises have, but he has a lovely tail and sentimental Indian eyes of a hazel hue, but his mealy mouth spoils him, though his entire back down to his side fins is of a deep sable, yet a boundary line distinct as the mark of a ship's hull called the bright waist. That line strikes him from stem to stern with two separate colours, black above and white below. The white comprises part of his head and the whole of his mouth, which makes him look as if he has just escaped from a felonious visit to a meal bag. A most mean and mealy aspect. His oil is much like that of the common porpoise. Beyond the duodecimal, this system does not proceed, insomuch as the porpoise is the smallest of the whales. Above you have the, all the leviathans of note, but there are a rabble of uncertain, fugitive, half-famous whales, such as the American whalemen. Uh, I know by reputation, but not personally. I shall enumerate them by their fo forecastle appellations, for possibly such a list may be valuable to future investigations, who may complete what I have but begun. If any of the following whales shall hereafter be caught and marked, then he can readily be incorporated into this system, according to his folio, octavo or duodecimal magnitude. The bottle-nosed whale, uh, the junk whale, the pudding-headed whale, the cape whale, the leading whale, the cannon whale, the scrag whale, the coppered whale, the elephant whale, the iceberg whale, the cog whale, the blue whale, etc. from Iceland, the Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch and Old English authorities, there may be quoted other lists of uncertain whales, blessed with all manner of uncouth names, but I omit them as altogether obsolete, and can hardly help suspecting them for mere sounds full of leviathanism, but signifying nothing. Finally, it is stated at the outset that this system would not be here and at once perfected. You cannot but plainly see that I have kept my word, but I now leave my cetological system standing thus unfinished, even as the great cathedral of Cologne was left, with the crane still standing upon the top of the uncompleted tower. For small erections may be finished by their first architects, grand ones, true ones, ever leave the copestone to posterity. God keep me from ever completing anything. This whole book is but a draft, nay, but the draft of a draft. Oh, time, strength, cash, and patience. <laughs> End of chapter 32, Cetology. There we go. Half an hour read, that wasn't too bad. So, I, again, I'm still wondering, is that, uh, is that um, Ishmael or is it Melville making this great catalogue of whales? I wonder whose knowledge is that. Anyway, there we are. Um, don't forget to follow me. Tap on my face down there uh, to follow me. And uh, don't forget, all of the chapters are available in the um, um, in um, what's it called in the um, Playlist, that's the word, in the playlist of uh, Moby Dick. You can find that and see all the chapters there. Thank you for uh, thank you for watching and listening. I hope you're enjoying it. Let me know if you are. Um, see you all later. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.